Uh, hi everyone, I'm here to talk about GLIPC. Um, I've tried to put this together as a sort of uh, call to action for a first time contributor or a fairly new contributor. Um, but I'm also hoping that maybe it's useful, at least, at least entertaining to people who uh, are experienced programmers and already know their stuff. Um, who am I? Uh, my name's Arjun. Uh, I'm an uh, upstream uh, GLIPC contributor. I also co-maintain uh, GLIPC in Fedora and uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, which of course means that I work at Red Hat. Um, so I'm going to try to, uh, this is the last talk. I want to make this uh, really quick uh, to talk about whatever I have to say and leave some extra time for questions and answers. I hope I make it. It's, it's really my first talk, so I'm not sure how I'll get the timing right. But I'll, I'll try my best to leave as much time as I can for questions and for people who want to maybe leave early to, to party, right? Um, so I'm going to go uh, with an introduction. Uh, I, I talked about seven steps in my title, so I'll quickly jump into the seven steps. And then uh, I'm going to uh, walk, uh, walk through a patch, a GLIPC patch, a recent GLIPC patch, just to kind of show uh, what kind of goes into uh, writing a patch. And then uh, I'm going to talk about what you could do to uh, contribute to and help with GLIPC. And then, of course, uh, questions at the end. And we're off. So uh, I uh, was first introduced to the C language in high school. I knew a little bit about stdio.h and malloc. And uh, to be honest, it was mostly uh, magical incantations that I wrote in the middle of my program. To, uh, to print and to get input and to allocate some memory. Uh, I, I really believed it was something uh, that's happening within the compiler and uh, kind of didn't really think too much about it. But you know, very soon I realized, ha, huh, you know, string length, for example, is a function that can be written in C. So it's, it's, it's not really magic. There's, there's something going on there. Um, obviously, eventually, I, I got into this field, and I know a little bit more about uh, all of this. Well, not all, but some of it. It's, it's, it's a pretty wide topic. Uh, so I know that a lot of it is actually mostly written in C. Mostly written in C. So um, what, what is glibc? It's, it's the standard C library. Uh, we have uh, all of those functions and a lot in between. For example, um, one might think that main is the first, first thing that starts exec executing when you start a program. But there's, there's quite a bit that goes on before that that is uh, the loading of the program, uh, placing everything in the right places, fixing up uh, function addresses, and then finally you call, call uh, main, and then you go on with the execution. So there's a lot more to, to GLIPC than just providing the functions. It is the runtime. Um, OK, so next uh, we're going to talk about why it's maybe useful or my, why you might want to contribute to GLIPC. I think the first reason, at least for me, is that it's very high impact. Uh, there are millions of installations. It is the uh, C library for the majority of you know, non-Android uh, Linux-based operating systems. Uh, if you make a change in malloc, for example, that, that shows up on the critical path, you're looking at you know, trillions of executions of the code that you wrote in a week or something like that. I, I don't know what the exact numbers, but you can think about it. Every time malloc goes through, your code's in there doing something. So uh, that, that, that's what actually makes me very happy about being able to work on this stuff. Uh, the other uh, thing is we actually have a fairly uh, actively developed uh, uh, piece of software. Uh, it's not really like some arcane old thing that's never really updated. We have over 1,000 commits a year, which means uh, we regularly add bugs that need to be removed. Um, my personal experience with the community is that it has been very welcoming to me, uh, very kind. Uh, mistakes are, uh, are, are welcome and, and accepted and understood. We all uh, you know, commit bugs once in a while and help each other out to fix it. It's, it's like any other piece of software, really. Uh, we recently, I think recently is not really accurate, but I think it's been more than a year already. We have a weekly public video patch review meetings. So people who have recently submitted a patch can actually show up to that meeting. There's a link somewhere in our wiki. Uh, show up to the meeting and talk about your patch or, or say that you want review. And uh, someone will be assigned to look at it. 
Uh, a lot of the regular attendees are basically like regular contributors. I don't show up very often to that meeting, for example, but once in a while I do and uh, try to find or get assigned a uh, like a, maybe a beginner's patch because I, I do care about this. I do care about it makes me happy to it's first of all easy to to review a patch by a beginner. And it makes me happy to see that we have another person who, who made a contribution and who might make more contributions, right? It's, it's uh, got this kind of multiplying effect. So uh, we have all of this, and uh, we do look out for, uh, for patches from new contributors. And uh, we also have a code of conduct that is a work in progress. So yeah, we, we do care about being welcoming, being kind to everyone, and trying to get uh, as much as possible uh, contributions from uh, people who are willing. OK, uh, I said seven steps. It was uh, a clickbait, to be honest. I didn't know how many steps it would be. I don't think there's a fixed number of steps. But I did shoehorn the seven steps here. You can see them. Uh, <coughs> so you do a git checkout. And uh, uh, this is a bit of an idiosyncrasy. You need to be building in a separate directory. And you, you can't really build in the same directory as the source tree. Uh, I don't know the reasons for it. It's something to do with the build system. I don't know most things about GLFC, to be honest. Uh, so you build in a separate directory, and uh, you, you need to make sure at configure time that you provide a prefix, which is about where it's going to be installed. It's just a couple of idios idiosyncrasies to building glibc that don't exist in a lot of uh, uh, similarly packaged applications, right? So let's say that you're trying to fix a bug. Uh, a good uh, a good place to start is by maybe adding a new test that fails without this bug having been fixed. So that's a potential step three. You implement the fix. Uh, you do some testing. We recently added a couple of uh, recent is, 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 always, uh, is always a bit of a longer time span when it comes. But maybe I think a couple of years ago, maybe slightly more, uh, we added a couple of scripts to help you run a program not on the systems installed uh, C library, but on the one that you just built. So there's test run for that. And then there's, you know, you need to do a lot of special things to get GDB to uh, pick up the uh, in tree freshly built glibc sources. Uh, sorry, uh, not sources at this point, of course, executable. And then run it with a test program. And so we have a script to help with that as well. Um, and you can do, use that to kind of check out how your uh, test and your fix is working. And then eventually, you delete uh, the build directory. You reconfigure. You, you run make check. You make sure everything's working fine. And perhaps you submit a patch to libc alpha at sourceware.org. That is our mailing, mailing list. We uh, submit patches there. We discuss patches there. Right? Um, is that the end of the talk? Maybe not. <coughs> so um, I will now go into a, uh, the anatomy of uh, a relatively simple patch. I try to look for something that is on the order of magnitude halfway between uh, a fixing uh, of a typo in a comment to like a entirely new, uh, let's say, feature that, 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 that changes you know, dozens of files. Somewhere in the middle of that is this. It's a uh, fairly uh, simple fix that went into glibc recently. Uh, my colleague Florian, who is an experienced developer and a prolific committer in the glibc source tree, he submitted this a couple of days ago. I reviewed it for him. Um, and uh, it's basically a fix to a function called stir error. Uh, and apparently, this function must not return null. We'll go into why. So for some reason, stir error, the function was returning null in some cases, and it's not allowed to do so. Uh, and then you know, uh, Florian goes, goes on to explain that we made a recent change where stir error was implemented in terms of another function, stir error underscore l, and that's what caused this sort of regression that needs to be fixed, right? Um, what is stir error and stir error underscore l? So stir error is basically, uh, if you know Erno, the error number, it takes in a, a number, which, which potentially is the error number, and it returns a string corresponding to that number describing what that error might mean. Uh, obviously, if you put zero, you get success. And I did not know this, and I, I really don't know if this was a joke or, or if, it's, if it's, I don't know, divine intervention, but stir error 42 returned no message of desired type. I have not read the book. 
<laughs> but 42 is apparently an interesting number. And uh, I thought it was funny that uh, this is the reply you, got, you get when you try to find out what 42 means. So uh, str error underscore l is a very similar function that uh, returns a string in the current locale, which might have a different language than the one the, the uh, then in a given locale, sorry, not the current locale. The current locale is the one in which the program is running. So the program is running in locale x. You want the error message in locale y for whatever reason. You use this other function. Obviously, you can now see why str error can be implemented in terms of str error underscore l. You just pass the current locale and you get it back. So someone made that change, which was definitely an improvement, right? We, we don't want to duplicate code, but it caused a regression. And why was, was it a regression? Um, str error is not allowed to return null, but str error underscore l actually, actually is allowed to return null for, for some reason. And, um, the details of that are actually in this uh, little bit in uh, the, the POSIX documentation for these functions. Right? POSIX tells you uh, what these functions are allowed to do in what circumstances. And uh, basically, the, the POSIX manual says that whether successful or not, str error must return a pointer to a generated message string. Uh, but str error underscore l does only need to return it upon a successful com completion. If it's a fail, it can return null. So the moment we made str error use str error underscore l, we started having the same behavior that it was sometimes returning null. That was, that was the bug. So uh, <coughs> now we're actually looking the, at the patch that Florian wrote. It was a test and a small change to the code, right? I really want to show that, I think my idea here is to show that a patch is not so complicated here. Like, you can see this and see that it's not, I don't know, like arcane magic, right? Um, so the test uh, you know, includes some uh, usual headers. You see a, a few uh, headers called support slash something. Those are actually part of the glibc uh, test rig. When you run the test suite, you can um, actually use some helper functions to do a lot of things, like implement some checks. Um, you know, do some uh, error checking for functions that you're not testing, and so on. So we have some helper functions for it. The patch has a test. This is where the, this, these are the headers that the patch had. So um, first, uh, we're going to look at the test itself. So I think I should be using this at this point. Okay, is that visible? Yeah. Okay, so it's a function that tests this stir error, and what it does is uh, it sets a variable called fail malloc, which when you turn it true, uh, apparently some malloc is going to fail. Every malloc from here on is going to fail, right? And then you call str error with a weird number, which obviously is not a regular like result that you get for an error. And then um, you get the result for it, and then actually you stop uh, causing malloc to fail because you don't want the rest of the test to stop working, right? Only for the call of the str error, you want malloc to fail because we know that that is the, 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 the point at which str error was returning null. It was trying to do an allocation and would fail and would just return nothing. So uh, we got malloc to fail, uh, we got a result, and then we're actually checking that this result is the same as this string unknown error, which is the, which is the default string for uh, for any, any kind of error that you don't really know what it is. So we, we expect this. So this test compare string is actually from the test rig. Like I said, we have the support directory where you have all of these helpers. It's one of those helpers is this. It just compares strings and it logs an error if they're not equal, right? Um, oh, I, I, can, I, I forgot I can, I can use this to change slides. So now uh, we're looking at uh, the test itself. So uh, the test trick actually has uh, this bit where it, it makes sure a test will not run forever, right? If the test was a main program that never returned, then uh, you'd, you'd run make check and it would be stuck running one of these tests forever. So uh, what we do is for, for tests that we, uh, we have in glibc, we require you to actually define this function called do test and then write all of your testing inside it and then you just include the rest of the test rig, which, which has a main function, and that will actually make sure that this do test doesn't run for more than a couple of seconds. So that test will return, or you know, if, if the test gets timed out, then it actually errors out, and we know that this test hangs for some reason. So 
Um, that's, that's pretty much all of uh, the tests. So uh, Florian did include another test poster, error underscore L. Um, but that's not important. I just want to talk about the one piece. So that's what I boarded here, right? And now we move on to really the, the end of the, the test itself, which is the malloc, which we said that there could be a malloc that fails. And uh, this is the malloc that uh, was in the patch. So it's a malloc, uh, which will obviously take precedence over the malloc in the, in the C library. If you define this function in your test, it's going to get picked up before the, the, the glibc's malloc gets picked. And what it does is, if this fail malloc is true, it returns a null, which means it won't, mal it won't allocate. And uh, otherwise, what it does is it goes into the, into the glibc uh, uh, dot so, and it, it picks out the actual malloc, and it asks it to do an allocation, right? Because we, we don't want to re-implement the whole malloc. We just use the one that, that actually works. OK, uh, we finished writing the test. How do you add a test to the uh, glibc source tree? Uh, this is a string-based test. Stir error is a string uh, function. And so we have a directory for that. You just go to the make file, and there's going to be uh, this little line called tests, and then you just add the name of the test here without the dot C. It's, it's literally just that. You write this function. You don't write it as main. You, you, you write it as do underscore test, and then you add it here to, uh, to the make file. And you have already a test that will start, start to fail, right, without the fix. Um, so now. And I really hope this is visible because it was really, really hard for me to split this among multiple slides. So now we're looking at uh, the fix itself, right? Uh, I'll, I'll quickly go through this. So we have stir error underscore L. Like I said before, we implemented stir error in terms of this function, right? So this is the function where the problem lies now. I know it's allowed to return null, but there's nothing wrong if it stops returning null also. Right? It's, we can do better than what the, the standard requires. So we'll now make mo both of these functions not return null in any case. Um, so we have this uh, error number that we get. Uh, ignore that bit. It's, it's not about error no. Error no is, is something else. Let's, let's not talk, think about that right now. So we have this error number from the user, and we, which we need to convert to a string. Uh, we go to the error list. Really, let's not care about the details. We get to the, we get to the, uh, go to the list, and we get the number, and we get a string corresponding to it. And if we don't get uh, a string for that number, then we know that it's, it's an unknown error. We don't know what this error is. If, if we knew it, what it was, we'd have it in that list uh, from the get error list, right? So we're in this piece where we don't know what it is. If we know what it is, then we just translate it to the locale that is re requested, and then we just return it, right? So uh, th this is what the code looked like before. Here on the right side, this is what the code looks like after the fix. Everything else is the same. It's just that this bit, where we don't know the error, it got fixed. And, and so what got fixed there? What got fixed is uh, we were trying when we know that there's an error number, let's say 999, right? That's what we had in the test. We are trying to return something like unknown error space 999, right? We're trying to create, like on the fly, a string with the number also, so that eventually, when it shows up in the application somewhere, that number is not completely lost. That number is still there. We're trying for it. So what we were trying to do was we're trying to do an AS printf, which basically it allocates memory and it prints into the memory whatever you want. It's, it's basically like printf, but it'll create its own buffer, and it'll print into a string, right? So we call as printf, and whenever as printf return minus 1, because it could, couldn't allocate memory, we were returning null, OK? And what we do now is, OK, so we tried to return unknown error 999, and uh, as printf failed. So, OK, Florian changed this a bit. We, we were looking for a minus 1 for failure. Now we are looking for greater than 0 for success. Uh, why is that? Because ASPrintf returns the number of uh, bytes that were written. So if it wrote a few bytes, we knew, know that it succeeded. If it wrote 0 bytes, we actually know that uh, something went a bit odd there, right? It didn't write anything. 
And if it returns minus one or any negative number, then of course that's also an error condition. So, um, so that kind of got reversed, right? Now we had the error condition uh, first, and then we, then we had the the success case. So we change this around a bit. So if we succeed, we set the uh, the return uh, string to the one that we got from the printf. But if we fail, what we do here is we return simply unknown error without the number, right? Which is a static <coughs> string. We don't need to allocate anything for it. It's just unknown error. It was part of the binary anyway. It's just going to get returned. So that's the fix, right? That's the fix. And now we look at this and we are sure that we are never going to be returning null. OK. Um, <coughs> I do want to pause here and ask uh, if, if, this, if this is completely gibberish or it kind of made sense. Kind of made sense. Does, does it, it, are there any sort of, uh, let's say, C beginners here who, who see this and feel like, OK, that's not too hard. It's not arcane magic, or maybe? OK, I think that's what I was hoping for. I was just hoping to show that you know, a glibc patch is, is not all that. right? It's not all that. So <clears throat> that's the fix. And um, that is actually the entirety of the patch. I, I know I kind of formatted it and showed it in a slightly different way. That was uh, Florian's patch, which uh, fixed this bug. And uh, that's actually like what I really wanted to make a point about. Uh, now, uh, I want to talk about what you could do to contribute to glibc as a, uh, well, even if you're super experienced in something else or, you know, uh, also super in experienced in glibc, but you're bored of doing uh, something uh, that you usually do, uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, that uh, require uh, relatively le less knowledge of the internals where you could make a difference. Um, so the first one is that you could write new tests. And you could improve old ones. Um, for example, uh, we have the so you know Fedora. I'm also a Fedora contributor. So we have the Fedora glibc package, and then we have some CI behind it, which runs a, a lot of tests. Some of those tests actually I wrote a few years back, and uh, didn't upstream them for whatever reason. Don't hate me. <coughs> so. Um, we run the CI, and uh, uh, which is which, which a lot of those tests are not really upstream. The, the reason for that is that some of them require setup uh, or you know altering the system's uh, kind of uh, configuration in some way, and you know those those are not the sort of tests you want to include in a test suite for a application where where like you're messing with the user system. You probably won't even it, it'll fail because it'll try to I don't know modify nsswitch.conf and it can't, right? Uh, but uh, since then, we, we actually have uh, uh, containerized tests in glibc. Um, so I'm going to go back here. So instead of uh, adding uh, an entry to this tests uh, line, you add it to a different line called tests-container, which you can write a containerized test. You can uh, make a little directory containing all the files that you want inside the container. And you can actually write a test that does a bit of setup or has a bit of setup that modifies the system, but you know it won't modify the system. It will run inside a container. So um, you, could do some you could do some tests like that. You could look at the CI tests for Fedora and then upstream them as containerized tests, for example. right? Uh, you could uh, write documentation. I'll, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. Actually, I, I just attended a, a talk earlier today where um, uh, it was about for, you know it was about beginners feeling like how it feels to be a beginner in um, in the in the open source community and actually the the speaker there said that we should have good documentation so I, I feel bad about that that I'm saying uh, write documentation is a is a beginner task but okay um, for people who uh, are a bit into GDB uh, there's this whole thing called pretty printers I think it's a f I don't know much about it but I think it's like a Python thing where you can uh, Write pretty printers, and we have lots of like these opaque uh, glibc data structures. You know, maybe uh, maybe bits of the glibc heap. Maybe there's a way to like walk through the heap. Maybe uh, some um, other opaque types like a lock. Is a lock locked? Because if you try to see like a pthread mutex type and see what its values are, like it doesn't say whether it's locked or not. It's going to have some you know some numbers behind it. 
So you could write a pretty printer that actually uh, just prints like, okay, this lock is currently locked or, or not. Um, occasionally, when you're just like reading code, sometimes you'll notice like it's changed a bit, so the comment is a lie, and uh, nobody caught it at, at review time. You know, it feels like it often feels like it's not of value, but honestly, it is, right? It is of value. There, there is value in uh, in fixing that. Uh, obviously, it's not so glamorous, but it helps. Um, we also have a bug tracker uh, where you could, you know, sort by new and maybe like confirm that this bug actually happens for you, or you know, try these bugs, uh, see why they happen, all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, some some more relatively more specific uh, ideas. So uh, you could optimize the integer to string conversion in printf. Um, you could uh, rewrite the base64 decoding encoding. Uh, we also don't have uh, info pages for dlopen and pthread, uh, a lot of pthread functions and some dlopen and uh, related functions. You could write those, um, explaining uh, the details of, the, of how the glibc implementation uh, handles these things. And uh, we have uh, this uh, mtrace, uh, which is currently a Perl script, but you could convert that to C. So these are like concrete things. I'm uh, just mentioning like which which you, which we could ha use help with some help with right. Uh, we also have uh, awk and Perl scripts that we picked up at various points of time, and we could kind of standardize on Python and kind of reduce the n uh, no hate for these, just reducing the number of uh, things that uh, we need to build glibc. Um, yeah, so uh, a lot of things to do. I promise to leave a lot of time for questions, and I see it's only five minutes. I'm sorry about that. Uh, but uh, I hope some of you will stay and keep asking. Uh, I'm here to answer anything that I can. Um, final uh, kind of links. We have a wiki. It's, uh, it's very out of date, to be honest, but it's still useful. Uh, we have the bug tracker, and uh, we have the development mailing list. And then this one I, uh, is, I would say, really, really nice. Uh, Lipsy help for, for people who don't, uh, uh, don't want to uh, like don't feel so comfortable like posting a patch like from the get go, but need help with something. Like maybe you want to ask what you could work on. Maybe you want to talk about something you're trying to work through, but you're having trouble. So um, like everything Lipsy related is sort of on topic here, right? You could write there and, and ask questions. Uh, you could also, hey, like just sort of, kind of, sort of a beginner here myself, to be honest, right? It's it takes years working on this stuff and still feeling like you don't know much. But you could write to me, and if I don't answer you, I'll point you to someone who can answer you. So um, now, questions. Uh, so I'm just going to repeat the, the question, which is that uh, for a lot of application uh, level stuff, there's uh, you know a like a more modern, uh, I guess, uh, repository, and uh, like a contributing.md, uh, possibly on GitHub, and uh, glibc doesn't have that, and also a lot of people take it for granted that you know it's probably works good enough. I guess that's what you want to say. And so how do we hope to have more contributors? To be honest, this is a question I do not have an answer to. Um, it is uh, quite an old uh, piece of software. Um, it is well established. The truth is that there is, as I said, over 1,000 comments a year. I actually checked. Uh, maybe not like, uh, not every release is 500 plus comments, but the average is, is like over 1,000. So it's happening. Um, I think a lot of the contributors do tend to be full-time employees of uh, like uh, software companies in this field. That is quite true. 
it's it's a hard problem, really. To, uh, I, I must say, it is a hard problem to. I, I know it's it's just not as like it's it's also not as glamorous as the kernel, right? I don't know the solution to this. I don't know the solution to this. But uh, you're right. It's I think it is sort of harder to get contributors into this than uh, than to some other stuff. So I guess that's that's my answer. We can take one more question and then remaining on the pool part. Yeah. Sounds sounds good to me. Okay, so two, uh, you can go first. Yes, so there are a lot of things you could do. First of all, if you found the bug, obviously you could file a bug report uh, while you're working on the patch. File a bug report, assign it to yourself. You don't have to, but it's, it's, it's good to do that. Um, but literally sending to the, uh, this mailing list is all you need to do. You could, you could be a drive-by contributor who, uh, who does a, like a patch that sort of fixes it, but has some issues. And you could just like send the patch here and walk away and, and never come back if, if you don't want to. And we will still, we might still actually work on it and uh, write ourselves down as a co-author and finish the, finish the patch. I've seen that happen at least once fairly recently. Somebody fixed a uh, bug in some, uh, some t one of the glibc utilities that, that ships some executable. I don't know which it was. And uh, I think someone kind of fixed up the patch a bit and then like committed it on their behalf. So like, that's it. We, we, it's a bit old fashioned, I will admit. Uh, so I, I use uh, git send email. Um, I also remember that uh, my, my company actually changed the way, uh, like our email provider. And there was like a few months in between where I was nervous that, am I gonna be able to send patches the same way as I could? And I was like using my private email address to send patches. But it's, it's uh, git send email works for me even now, and uh, that's the one I use. But you could attach it to an email and just send it, to, send it here, and, and it should be fine. We don't have full requests. So, so this how about the, the license agreement? Sorry? The, the license agreement, does it need to be required anymore? Aha, uh -huh, okay, good question. I will come to you. So uh, good question. So uh, license agreement, I, I guess you mean uh, copyright assignment? Uh, yeah. Yes. So. Uh, you may assign copyright to the Free Software Foundation if you wish to, but it is not required anymore. You could do a um, developer cert certificate of origin. You don't need to assign copyright. So okay. that requirement is gone. It's a new thing, new thing. Yeah, it is fairly new, yes. So my question is, I've been contributing to some smaller free sources in the past, but whenever when I try to read source code of something big like the kernel or GBT right now in the Apache, there were so many bugs about that I really have trouble making sense of do you have recommendations for any kind of preferably free Creative Freedom tooling to make understanding this easier when you dive in? Oof. I, I have the same. So the question is, uh, are there any free tools to kind of help understand uh, all of the, the function calls that, that happen there, which are like, you know, you don't know what's going on there? The answer to that is uh, I, I actually don't. I have the same problem myself. I try to avoid looking at a lot of context and just trying to look at this particular patch, look at this particular bit of code. Okay, I'm out of time. Uh, I can continue answer qu answering questions, but we will do it off this, uh, off this platform.